Right, so welcome everyone to the call. Let me just put your hands down. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us both, with Robin and I this evening, or this afternoon, depending on where you are. I think most of you are in the UK. Um, as you know from the email that I sent out to you all, I um, I really wanted to, you to have the opportunity to meet with Robin. I had, I've listened to a couple of webinars of Robin's in the past, and I was so struck by um, the clarity with which he speaks and the relevance with which he speaks. And it, as a business owner, what he was talking about really made sense to me. And he's so very, Robin's so very practical in the way that he comes across and the way that he explains concepts. It's his engineering background, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it is, isn't it? But it's one of the things that I found is that there's there's a lovely crossover that which is two re well there's lots of reasons why I love Robin but there's two two big things here one is that in the world of business in the world of me listening to people talking about business Robin's so refreshing because he's not talking about the traditional things that lots of you have listened to about six steps to grow your five figure business and your your seven figure blueprint and all that kind of stuff right he's talking about a, a deeper understanding a deeper way of us approaching our business that transforms it completely which is totally different from anything else we're hearing in the business space and and also in the three principles space which some of you I'm going to ask for a show of hands in a moment in fact just put your hands up while I'm talking if you know what I mean when I'm even talking about the three principles if you've ever heard the words, you understand a little bit about the concept. So we know kind of how to pitch the call. But in the world of the three principles, which is the understanding that Robin's going to talk to us about, Robin's also very unique in that world because he's got this real practical um, side to the way that he talks about um, the principles, which I'd never heard from anyone else before as well. And so um, I heard Robin speak a couple of times stalked him for a little bit on the internet and uh, and ended up going to see him for uh, spend four days with him about a month ago probably now three weeks four four weeks ago and it was it was a strange it was a strange few days for me I, I I can't tell you whether I enjoyed it or I didn't enjoy it but I know that something that happened for me was that I went to that event I heard something, I can't even tell you what it was, but I came home and I slept for four days straight on my sofa, which I never do, ever do. And um, at the end of that time, I, on the evening of the fourth day, I, I, I pulled out my notepad and I wrote down this idea and I just had this most amazing idea that just came from nowhere. And it was really simple and it was a no-brainer and it's something, it was an answer to a problem I've been struggling with for the last two years. And I hadn't been able to get a, a solution to it at all. So I don't know what it was that Robin did, but I'm intrigued. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I just love hanging out with you. And I wanted to share you with the people here in, in this group, just because it's a gift to the people in this group, I think. So I just want to see. So we've got some hands up when I talk about um, the principles. Come on, you guys. There are way more of you than that that need to put your hands up that know about the principles. There's names on here that I recognise. I would say there's probably about 80% um, of people here that, are, that know about the principles and the rest that have no idea what we're talking about, Robin. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand over to you to say hello and, and we'll just get started with, you know, the people who are coming along to this call most of them are solopreneurs, so they're running their own businesses, they're doing it single-handedly or with a very small team. Robin, I know, spends a lot of time working with corporates, um, but the principles that he's talking about here apply equally well to you as a solopreneur as they do to, um, to, to a big corporate CEO, something like that. So Robin, I'm going to hand over you to just kickstart us. The people here want to know about, they want to know practical things like how do I increase my business? How do I get more clients? How do I get my message out there in the world? How do I grow my business bigger or how do I make it easier? Those kind of typical kind of entrepreneurial questions. And I know your take on how we go about getting to the answers to those questions can be quite different from what a lot of people are expecting. So I'm going to hand over to you and I'll just ask you questions as we go through. Well, Nick, thanks so much for, um, for inviting me. Uh... We had a, just for everybody on on the webinar. We had a blast with with uh, 
Nick on this program. We had 12 people uh, of, of whom Nick was one of them. And um, uh, I wouldn't say you were an outlier, Nick, but you were having a different course than everybody else. <laughs> I was doing my own thing. <laughs> uh, but, um, but you're a real, a real sweetheart, as they say here in the US. And so, you know, any, any, of, any of your friends are my friends, so happy to ha uh, hang out with you guys and, and be as helpful as I can. Cool. Um, now I can't see hands, so I can't. So can, I'll manage can I, when I ask a, a question, could you could you let me know, Nick, what people people re reply? Yeah, sure. And also, guys, you can um, you type in the question box if you've got any questions for Robin. I'll I'll kind of when I'm you see me staring off to the side, I'll manage the question box here. So yeah, I'll tell you as questions come up. We're going to ask be asking for you to give questions later anyway, guys. And um, there's an opportunity for sort of some hot seat coaching with Robin here. So make the most of that. If that's something you, you've got a business challenge and you want to bring to Robin, just be thinking, well, don't be thinking about that while he's talking, but you know, it'll pop up and type it in the box and I can call on you. So um, yeah, I can manage the admin side here, Robin, whatever you want to know. Well, um, so here's a proposal. Um, what, I'll, what I'd love to do is contrast how I came to see this because I have a pretty classical sort of business background. Um, and so I often get asked the question, how, how come I'm sharing the principles, which look pretty abstract or esoteric? Um, how come I'm sharing that when I have a sort of hardcore business background? So I, I'd like to sort of couch that. And it, mm. and that would also um, be a, a setup or a lead in for me to explain what it is we share and why it pr produces the, the, or it answers all the questions that you mentioned about how to this, how to that. Yeah. Could, could you ask everybody if that's a, that, if that's what they want to hear. Does that look good? Put your hands up if that's a yes. No, they all said no, Robin. <laughs> no, they said yes. They said yes. So um, uh, I'm an engineer. My training um, did actually work as an engineer and then got moved on to the business side. And if you think about business, it's essentially engineering. Um, you've got processes. You're trying to figure out how to optimize the system. You're trying to figure out how to make the system produce more profit, more revenue. Um, so business was a logical transition to someone who, who thinks about things logically. And, and I had the good fortune to work for very, very big, very um, professional companies that gave me a lot of training on the how-to and the 12 steps, the three steps, you know, the seven habits of highly effective people. And all of that stuff was remarkably useful. I mean, it really was. And um, I just as an engineer, was perpetually curious about how things worked. And the further I got in my career, the more I, I, I noticed that I would work with brilliant people who would, uh, at an alarming rate, be ri rather stupid. So you'd be with the, you know, someone who'd invented something brilliant, taken it to market, um, clearly had a lot of EQ, IQ, you name it. And then I'd be in the meeting and they'd do something absolutely thick, you know, and I'd be like, what happened? What happened mm. to the smart person I met in the last meeting who this time showed up in the same body but is doing something different? And then the more I reflected on this, the more I saw I was no different. I had days where I would, you know, leap tall buildings, go home without having broken a sweat, having accomplished masses of work. Uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum were days where I, if I'd stayed at home and watched soap operas on TV, the world would have been further ahead. And then the rest of my life was somewhere between the two. Yeah. No, no one could explain what caused that variability. And the more I looked at it, the more I saw that it was a massive factor in how well business worked or how badly business worked. And then I was very lucky about 15 years ago to come across a guy called Sid Banks, who some of you might have um, heard of, who was the, the person who coined or after whose epiphany, the, the words, the principles were coined. And um, just for those of you who don't know what they are, the principles are just some basic facts about how the mind works. I mean, that's, it's called the principles, but it's really, really just three facts, and I'll explain those in a moment. So when I learned this, or I, I learned a bit about these principles, I realized that that's actually what was missing um, in the field of management science, in the field of business, which was explaining this variability between high performance and low performance. And so I quit the big consulting company and started to figure out how to um, teach people in the business world this understanding. Now, 
here was the contrast to my previous life. Um, I used to be all about figuring things out, using my, my mind, working hard, seeing what the logic was, and um, using a lot of what I call brute strength. Um, so I had a pre pretty much an A-type personality, so I would you know, get the jackhammer out and keep going until I um, found an answer or didn't. And then when I learned the principles, or I learned this understanding which we call the principles, it alerted me to how very often in my life great ideas had turned up when I wasn't doing that. Mm. And it showed me that actually built into me and having helped me all along was this phenomenal capability that we all have, that we're mostly ignorant of, um, that if we paid more attention to, we could have more visible in our life. It's a bit like you... Um, um, I'll give you an analogy. I, I don't know how many of you have ever been to, to France, but in France, um, they, not long after the war, they invented these little motor scooters that were called mobilettes. And what they did is basically a sturdy bicycle. And on the front of the bicycle was a little engine, two-stroke engine. And it was very simple design. It had a rubber wheel on it. And when you pulled a lever towards you and clipped it in, it would engage the wheel of that engine on the wheel of the bicycle and it would motorize the bicycle. Mm. So depending whether you had the, 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 the lever pulled in, you had a motorized bicycle or not. And the logic was, if ever you run out of petrol, you could pedal it like a bicycle, but when you wanted a bit of boost, you could clip this thing in. Well, the design of the human mind is you were born with this little motor. It's actually a V12 engine. But no one's ever told you about this lever. So occasionally it gets knocked in and you motor along and you get all this stuff done and you, wow, this is great. Um, look, at, look what I can accomplish. And other days you swing your shopping bag onto the bicycle and you knock the lever out and it's not connected. And you're pedaling a really, really heavy bicycle with this V12 engine on the front, which adds even more weight. And those days it looks like a struggle. Yeah. Now what the principals did was they came along and they said, you know, Psst, hey, do you see that? That, that, that lever there, yeah, the thing I hang my groceries on. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not for hanging your groceries on. It actually connects the, the motor to the wheels. And the, the person gave me a little demonstration, and sure enough, I saw the, the impact of being connected to this, this force. Mm. You know, it's always been there. And throughout my life, I had fortuitously had the benefit of it. But when you understand the principles... You get to see that it's always there. It always has your back. And it's what you can access to answer all of those questions. Now, just to give you some trivia, some, some sort of scientific data to, to show you what sort of power we're talking about. Um, if you look at the human mind, or let's call the brain, because the brain is an organ that is sort of observable. The, the human mind is, you know, an abstract thing. And I, I don't know where the human mind is, but... Let's just look at the brain as a proxy. Mm -hmm. the, the total size of the human brain, if you measure it in terms of synaptic connections per second, so like a computer, ones and zeros, yep. is anywhere from 400 billion to a trillion connections per second. So that's the, the power of, of this computer. It's pretty amazing, right? A trillion connections per second. Mm -hmm. Now... That's everything. It's all the functionality that the, the, the brain is doing to run our body. Now, do you want to guess how many synaptic connections per second our conscious mind is? The bit that we talk to ourselves about or we're thinking about when we talk to other people or the bit we're using when we're consciously trying to solve a problem? Do you want to guess what that size is? I don't know. I don't, people... don't know if that would be loads of it. I don't know if that's loads of it or hardly any of it. <laughs> It's basically 20,000. Right. The 20,000 synaptic connections per second out of 1 trillion. Right. Which I think is 0.000005%. Right. So if you had to solve a problem, Nick, and it's the same to all of you out there, which would you prefer to be using? Yeah, that that's really interesting because I guess what most of us try and do is increase the number of... of of that from that 20,000 right so like oh well I need yeah. well if I could just get 40,000 going it would be fine so we try and rev yeah. that bit up or right we, 
Well, we worked the 20,000 really hard. Yeah. Whereas if you knew that you had, you know, what whatever one trillion is minus 20,000, you know, in the back office, as I call it. Yeah. Wouldn't you rely on that more? Yeah. Now, there's a little wrinkle in all of this, which is access. Now, this is where the other part of the principles comes in, mm -hmm. because what the principles essentially explain is how we're actually creating our experience in every single moment from the inside out. Basically, what we have is a movie production or a film production studio that's forever creating our reality. Now, this is a lovely thing. It's actually what allows us to, to experience all of the different feelings we have in life. But the problem is, if we don't realize that's what's going on, we react a lot more. Mm -hmm. And when we react, we overload the 20,000. And when the 20,000 are overloaded, the access to the deeper intelligence in you gets more distant. Which is why when you've got it, you know, you've been thinking really hard about a problem and you've, you've worked yourself up and you, you, you throw it down in disgust. And then you're in the in you know Marks and Spencers or wherever you know in the in the free aisle or whatever buying a yogurt and all of a sudden out of nowhere this brilliant idea turns up. Yeah. Now if at that point I'd said to you, what's going on in your head? You probably would have said, oh I don't know, strawberry or apricot. Mm -hmm. You probably weren't thinking up a storm. No. You probably weren't, you know, over analyzing anything. And because you weren't overworking the twenty thousand. The guys in the back office were able to get through to you with something useful to the problem that they knew you really wanted them to work on. Yeah. Now, many, many different um, modalities point towards this. So what we are sharing, Nick, is not new. This has been around for thousands of mm. years. The only difference, and it's a slight but it's a massive difference at the same time, is most other modalities suggest you go and do something to get to that quiet mind. Analyze your thinking, you know, there's, I mean, there's, look at all the different forms of meditation, you know, you can observe your thoughts, you can count your thoughts, you can let your thoughts dissolve, you can visualize them. Well, the good news is you don't actually have to do any of those things. The mind knows how to clear itself on its own. Yeah. Provided you allow it. Yeah. So the bottom line of what we share and we do this in the corporate world, is we educate people first how all of this works. We then have them experience how it works so that they can see it for themselves. Yeah. They then have this big realization, oh my God, everything I'm thinking and everything I'm experiencing is actually created in me. And then the minute they have that realization, a lot of the thinking just seems to drop away. They don't make it drop away. We don't come at them with a big wire brush and get rid of it. They just... I mean, it's what happened to you, Nick. Yeah. You went, went through a, a three-and-a-half-day program. You saw something at a deep level. You went home. You weren't quite sure what it was. You, you slept for four days, which probably meant you needed to sleep for four days. <laughs> yeah. And I'm guessing you woke up with a slightly clearer mind and a problem you've been struggling with for a long time. Now, you didn't make yourself settle down. You didn't make yourself have less on your mind. It just happened. No, I tried that. When I when I first, I was explaining this to a client today, when I first found out about the principles, um, one of the things that I heard loud and clear, which totally surprised me, um, which I never knew before, was that my, my fast, speedy brain and action taking was actually getting in my way. And I, I thought that was my competitive advantage. And I really prize to myself on that and so the first when I but when I I think it was from Dr George Pransky and he gave me a firm talking to about the busy mind and and I suddenly realized that that was um, an unhealthy way to be operating in the world and that there was an alternative way that would actually serve me much better and I took that almost as a prescription to like right so you've got to slow down and I spent probably 18 months trying to slow down in the most frustrating way and then, and then I, and then I kind of thought, oh, I'm, this is a, I'm, it's fighting a losing battle here, and I just stopped trying. 
And then I observed and what I noticed was six months later, I was a lot calmer inside my head than I had been the six months before. And it was nothing, it was not, like the 18 months I was trying really hard were nothing to do with the, the six months when it just kind of occurred on its own. And and in that first year, I had times where I was like, right, I am going to sit and do nothing for four days. And it was hell on earth. It was awful. And then the, the four days when I came back from spending time with you guys was just if I were to, to invent an explanation for it, it's just that my head, I've been working that 20% so hard on a particular problem for the last two and a half years that that it was exhausting me. And so something happened that shifted it that meant that I just, I just get, I, I gave up. I didn't, it didn't like, I just stopped thinking about the question. And as a result, I guess I just calmed right down. And then what do you know? Like, <laughs> four days later and I'm going this is taking months it's taking weeks it's taking years it's when is it going to happen and actually it was I don't know I just I guess I saw something new or I understood the system more deeply through through something that happened when I was with you guys quieted down I was all set to sleep for a week and then you know the, I just saw a path in front of me that was so clear and obvious and all of the the whirring here, just like the question hasn't even arisen again yeah. since then. Yeah, a good analogy, Nick, is, is a snow globe. Yeah. You know, how do you settle down a snow globe? You just stop shaking it. Yeah. And when you stop shaking it, it will naturally settle. Now, just to be clear um, to, you know, to all of the, the people on this webinar, we're not saying you have to go through life with a calm mind. Thankfully. You can be <laughs> the point is, if you know what's going on, yeah. it will take care of itself. So I often find myself busy-minded, um, or I'm distracted. Now, what's really good is I will notice that. Mm -hmm. And then if someone comes to me and says, Robin, I need a good idea from you on you know, X, Y, or Z, I will realize that given the amount of snow globe activity I've got going on, I'm probably not going to have a good idea. So I say to them, you know, I've got a lot on my mind. Um, do you really need it now? And they say, oh, yeah, I really need it now. I said, well, okay, I'll give you my best shot. But what I'd suggest is if you gave me 24 hours or you waited until, until tomorrow morning, I'm more likely to be settled and I'm more likely to have a better idea. But it's your choice. And they'll sort of, you know, grumble, mm, I really need it now. And I said, well, look, best, best you can get now or something better tomorrow. What do you want? I'm... I'm I prefer tomorrow, but hey, you you need it now. And they grumble and all say, okay, I'll take something better tomorrow. Yeah. Now, it wasn't an issue that I was in a, you know, I was busy-minded because I knew that I was busy-minded. Yeah. And then I noticed that uh, the report I had to write, it probably wasn't a good idea to be writing that report. So I restructured my day and I didn't. And then about an hour later, I noticed I wasn't busy-minded. Oh. Huh. So there's a, this is the um, what, what's great about the principles is it's it's the non-doing uh, side of it. There's nothing to do. Yeah, with my um, when whenever I'm doing like my simplicity circle or talking to clients, it's the the way or every blog post I write pretty much finishes with that sentence like there's less to do than you think. There's always less to do than you think. It's for me the more I the more I understand and, and learn about this is just like a dropping away of like, oh, I don't have to do that. Oh, why would I do that? It's just gradually layers and layers and layers that are peeling off that, yeah. that it just amazes me. Now, can I connect this to the, to the how to, the how to mm. question that everybody, you know, that everybody yeah. has, will always have, because it's not like you, one answer sort of, you know, crosses things off the list firmly when, particularly when you're building a business. Mm. You figure out how to survive Wednesday, and then you've got to figure out how to survive Friday, and then it starts again the following Monday. So when we work with teams, um, we first have them understand uh, how the mind works, and we have them understand three things. Um, first of all, that the mind um, works only one way, and that's from the inside out. And by that I mean, you know, it's our thinking creating our experience. We're not responding to the outside world. We're creating a, a dream, if you want thinking that it's real. Um, the second thing we teach people is the mind has a built-in design for success. And by that we mean there's this phenomenal horsepower, these trillion 
sort of firing synapses. This is back beyond that. This is intelligence flowing through us, which it, which will can really address any any question or any issue you have. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing we, we share with people is the more deeply you see those first two points for yourself, not at an intellectual level, but at, at a deeper level, mm -hmm. the more you'll find yourself in a state of high performance. Now, when teams learn this, we then have them practice on a real business problem. Because after two days of learning the principles, everybody's mellowed out. You know, some people say, well, this isn't natural. I mean, when I get back to work on Monday, you know, the, the brown stuff's going to hit the ventilator, as they say. So, you know, this is just because I'm in a nice hotel and I haven't worked for two days. So on day three of our program, we bring in, you know, what, what, what they call a BHAG. You know what a mm -hmm. BHAG is? A big, hairy-ass goal. Yeah. Um, and typically, it's something phenomenal that the business needs to accomplish, like saving $400 million or doubling revenue. I mean, these are not sort of small things. Now... The minute we plop that on the table, people sort of skid a bit, you know, because mm -hmm. it's a bit like um, you, you learn to ride a bicycle in your back garden and then the first day you go out and in traffic, you know, yeah. you start thinking about the cars and all of a sudden you can't ride your bicycle anymore. Well, what happens is within a short amount of time, they find themselves back in this nice balanced state and they notice the incredible ideas that surface. And then... When someone asks a question, they get really curious. And so they have a, a really rich conversation about whatever they're trying to get done. Mm -hmm. And what usually happens within a short amount of time is an insight pops up that addresses the question. And so what they learn, Nick, um, and everybody else on this webinar, is that they have the capacity in them to solve any problem that they have, provided they allow it to happen. And the way it happens is if your mind is settled. And the way to have your mind be settled is to remember how your mind works. Yeah. And so what happens is we split people up into groups, they, they subdivide the task, they work on things, and what invariably comes back is very often a, um, an order of magnitude bigger result than the one that we're aiming for, yeah. or half an order of magnitude. And so people get eventually habituated, not everybody, but most people get habituated to any question which comes up. Their first port of call is, hang on, let me see what the deeper intelligence in me says. Mm -hmm. and, and the way I would liken the mechanism, if I can, Nick, is the way you look at a menu in a restaurant. Right. Now, unless you're on a crazy diet or you have some food restriction, you don't analyze the menu. You sort of just look at it and say, hmm, veal piccata. Nice. Oh, asparagus. No, I don't fancy asparagus. Then you go to the next one. Now, if you notice, you're not analyzing each dish and doing a little Pareto chart or fishbone diagram. You're, you're literally wondering and seeing what thinking shows up about that dish. Yeah. And then, you know, the chicken, the, the chicken marsala will be the one that really strikes your fancy, so that's the one you order. Right. Well, well, the mind has that capacity to surface an answer on anything. So the shift that's occurred for me and the shift I see occur in our clients is that when they get a problem, rather than digging in and analyzing it to death, they get curious about it and they reflect and they see what thinking shows up. And if nothing shows up, they know that the guys in the back office haven't yet finished working on it. So it, it starts to look like a much more reflective or even passive process rather than a jamming process. Yeah. And the net result is people have really gentle conversations. They get to the heart of the matter very quickly. New ideas show up and the problem gets solved in record time. And it's it's literally unbelievable. I mean we've had clients scratch their head and say, no, that's not how do we do that? We we had one um, one event where Two hours into the the problem, they solved it. Yeah. And they looked around and said, "No, no, this, no, this is no, this is not possible. <laughs> it's too it obvious. Can't, it can't be obvious." <laughs> yeah. And then they got a very anxious because they had to report out at the end of the meeting to the board, and they said, "We're going to look like fools. This, this is just too simple." And then they turned on us and said, "If we're going down, you guys are going down." <laughs> <laughs> and so we said, "Well, what do you want to do?" And they were really, they were really, you know, frazzled. The, the snow globe was, you know, shaking mm. a lot. We said, why don't you spend the rest of these two days 
trying to find a pool with the solution you've just come up with. Mm -hmm. Now, the more they looked for flaws, the better the solution started to look. That's cool. <laughs> and worse, they uncovered a fatal flaw in another business, 40% of the company's business, that there was not part of the program. So they had a bit of what they call an oh shit moment. Which yeah. was, I mean, it's really good they found that out. And by the end of the of the four days, they were like, well, I guess this is a good answer because we just have been unable to put a hole below the waterline on this. Yeah. So they went out and they socialized it. Everybody adopted it. They thought it was great. They created what's called a six, design for Six Sigma, a particular type of project to push it forward. $35 million a year of profit impact per year. So we did, we had two hours of breakthrough thinking, and then we had sort of 14, 14 hours of, oh, come on, it can't really be true. <laughs> yeah, and you, but you guys work with people who have had all the traditional kind of management consultants and trainers and all the rest of it in the same way that lots of people on this call have had, I, I tend, the, the kind of people who tend to come to the stuff that I do fall into one of two camps. They tend to either be... Um, people who are trying to grow their business up and they're, they're buying all the marketing programs and the how-to programs and the six-step programs and the, you know, all, all those kind of programs and either getting, either just not getting the results or falling out of the program after about week two because it just doesn't resonate with them or um, working the system really hard, not getting the results and getting frustrated or getting really inconsistent results. So sometimes they do, sometimes they don't and, and, and so, so they think it's them or they think it's the system or they can't work out why. So there's, there's that group of people who, they, they're like your, your businesses who've tried bringing all the other consultants in. And then there's another group who are people who, who are doing phenomenally well in their businesses. Um, but they're, they're knackered, they're tired, they're burnt out and they're really not enjoying it. <laughs> and they're like, they, they've hit the levels of success and they're like, so what? And and it's interesting because it was the first group I was thinking of there when you were saying about um, you know thinking about those those breakthrough moments that people have. It's like quite often people have tried everything else and then somehow they stumble across the principles and this understanding, and it's yeah. the thing that creates the breakthrough, right? Yeah, and, pe and people people have been having breakthroughs all their life. Yeah. I mean, when, when people were born, they did not know that this thing was their hand. Anybody who's had a child will know that when the baby's born, it sort of, you know, will, will hit itself. And at some point, it will go, whoa, this thing is mine. <laughs> and then they start to figure out how to use it, and they know, figure out how to put it in all sorts of places. And, and we never have a single hand lesson in our life. Yeah. So how can we, we get so skilled in our hands? Because built into us is this phenomenal capacity. So we don't try and, we don't go to let hand school. I mean, it's just built into us. And likewise, we've had problems that we didn't know what to do with. We left them alone. We're in the shower. We're cutting the lawn. And then all of a sudden, I don't know where the idea comes. So you've been having this all your life. Mm -hmm. The only issue is you misunderstand what causes it. Completely. You think it's the shower. You think it's putting on soft music. You think it's cutting the lawn. Now, if you look at what happens in the shower or the lawn without getting icky on a webinar, <laughs> um, what happens in the shower is unless you're um, a tiling contractor and you're studying whether the grout has been well done or not, you mostly don't think too much. Yeah. Because you're doing something very repetitive. You don't even have to think about washing yourself. And so your mind is not being pushed anywhere unless you're the person who makes a, a list of your day's activities in the shower as part of your routine. Mm -hmm. But mostly people, people just get in and, and, and wash themselves. And when you're cutting the lawn, other than you know, trying not to cut down the plant that your mother, your, the little tree that your mother-in-law gave you that you never really liked, you're just going up and down, up and down. And again, you're not thinking too much. Yeah. Now the problem is if you told people don't think too much, they'd then go and think about not thinking too much, and mm -hmm. of course that would backfire. Yeah. But when you see that it's all thought, naturally thought just sort of drops away. You don't feel like agitating the, the snow globe so much. Yeah. So the, the way to get what you want to get done in business is to is to know that you have this capacity in you and just know how to have, have it show up more reliably. 
So, so this is a question for you then, with the um, that I often get asked by clients, and I, I, I have my own kind of version of the answer, but I'd love to hear your take on this, which is, so we have this, like, I keep saying it's here, right, <laughs> this back office here, this like 80, you know, the whatever is it, 99.9% .9 here that we're not using. And we have a problem or a, a business challenge or we want to come up with a new product or a new idea or, you know, a, a, something to inspire us for 2000 and whatever next year. And we, we, need, we need a way to bring money into the business quickly or there's something we want to, um, like a program we want to buy and we don't have the money for it so we need to go create the money for it. And we become aware that there's this back office and, and, and we know that that's where the good answers are going to come from, right? Anyone who's been around the principles for a while kind of has an understanding of that. And many of people will have had a realisation that that's actually true. Like they'll, they'll have evidence of what, where that's true. So this is the question. Like, what if it doesn't come quickly enough? Like, what if you have a timeline? What if you have... Um, a deadline and you need the back office to come up with answers now what would you what would you answer to that well um i'll give you two two um two answers one is getting an insight's like catching a bus if you don't know what a bus is good luck catching one right mm. you happen to fortuitously or if you if you know what a bus is but you don't know how they function the only way you'll catch a bus is if you happen to be walking past a bus stop, as the bus happens to stop and open the doors, and you'll catch the bus. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you'll see buses, but they won't stop. Now, if someone explains how a bus works, you'll know to go to a bus stop. You'll know which number to look out for, and you'll know to stick your hand out if it's a request stop so that the bus stops. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a timetable, which has been getting better these days, but in the past, the timetable was a vague indication. Yeah. Now, what you did is you waited, and finally the bus came. Now, very much like your question, what if I need to be somewhere at 10 o'clock? Well, if I understand how buses work, I don't leave home at 5 to 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's one thing. If you understand how the mechanism works, you'll factor it in, you'll build it in, you'll, um, you'll allow for it. Right? The second thing is... Um, there's the plan to have something by 10 o'clock or by when it's needed. But, and then there's real life. Now, the difference between the plan and real life is just how you think. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm all caught up in my ego and my personality that I, I, I'm going to disappoint the person because I'm not getting the answer when they need it, well, I'll suffer. Mm -hmm. And I'll shake the snow globe like crazy and my likelihood of getting an insight will go down. Yeah. If I see that we're all living an in, in inside out based experience anyway, I'll see that getting anxious about the 10 o'clock meeting that I don't have the answer for is just my thinking. Yeah. And as I settle down, I'll see, well, maybe um, there's something else to be seen. Maybe it's the wrong thing to give them the answer. Maybe, maybe it'll come to me just before. Maybe... Maybe I'll come up with a better answer. Or the example I gave earlier, where I'll say to someone, sorry, my mind is a bit busy. Mm. Um, I don't have a good answer for you. Now, what happens to me, Nick, is when someone I know someone needs an answer by Friday, I do my bus work beforehand. So the only time when I don't come up with the answer when, I, when it's needed is when something happens to me that you know, I, I can't prepare for. Yeah. But I've gotten very relaxed in, in sort of... Um, and this is going to sound a bit sort of, uh, I might, might sound spiritual, trusting the design of life. Trusting that I'm not actually running things. And, and the analogy here is, um, you know, when I was a kid, you could buy this little plastic steering wheel with a suction cup that you could stick to the back of your parents' car seat and you could pretend to be driving. Yeah. And it even had a little horn in the center. You could press it, you know, with compressed, with air little sort of thing that made a noise. Now, it wasn't connected to anything. It wasn't driving the car. It was just an amusement thing. Mm -hmm. But what happens to us in life is we actually think we're controlling life. 
And so things have to happen on command when we want them. If you realize you're not controlling life, you get a bit more relaxed about it. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like being on a boat. No wind shows up. Doesn't matter you wanted to sail that place. It ain't going to happen. Yeah. Now, if you don't understand thinking, you're likely to get bothered. If you understand thinking, you'll go, oh, well, the reality I had Im imagined isn't going to happen. I wonder what that's about. And I can tell you, countless times in my life, when the world hasn't gone the way I intended, and afterwards it's made complete sense that it didn't go that way, and it's pretty clear for me that I'm not holding the steering wheel. Or if I am, it isn't connected to anything. Yeah. And there's an intelligence flowing through life. And my job is to just get out of the way and let it run things. Now, I'm not proposing that we become, you know, um, zombies and just let anything happen to us. I don't mean, I'm not suggesting we should walk out into traffic and if we get hit by a car, well, it's just our thinking. No, I mean, common sense would be, is a good thing. But I have a plan, and I want to go somewhere, and I formulate it, and then life happens. Yeah. And as I reflect, because I know that it's all a, an, in, an inside-out game anyway, I sometimes see how my plan wasn't actually useful, and thank God the universe nudged me in a different direction. Yeah. Now, you've got to be respectful when you, when you have that orientation, because not everybody does. Especially in business. If, yeah. But what we've found is that the more we explain the principles to our clients, the more they have this approach. So let me give you a very practical one. Mm. They have an agenda which has 10 items on. There's a half-hour block for everything. Well, who said each thing would take half an hour? It was a guess, but it might not. Now, what happens often in the corporate world is as they get to minute 28, to not get behind with the agenda, they jam everything into those last two minutes to try and achieve it. And usually they do a really crappy job. Mm -hmm. Or the other thing that happens is they flap on and they eat into the next item, eat into the next item. In the end, they spend an hour and a half on that first half hour item and they don't get everything done. Now, when people learn the principles and learn how the mind works, they take a very different approach. First of all, before the meeting starts, they reflect on whether the agenda makes sense. Are we trying to get too much done in this meeting? Does this make sense or not? And they might slim it down to, let's do two things well rather than ten things badly. I mean, there's a, an old adage which is, you know, have one meeting for one topic. And so that's the first thing they do. They, they, they get wise and thoughtful and have common sense about what they're trying to get done. The next thing they do is when they start the meeting, they, sh they actually check who's showed up. And I don't mean whether Nick showed up, whether Robin showed up, but which version of Nick showed up, which version of Robin showed up, mm. and everybody else. Because if out to lunch Robin shows up, you're not going to get much value out of this. Yeah. <laughs> and so they first make sure who shows up. And if they don't have people who are separate enough to do the work, they will cancel the meeting. Right. Or they will give a bit of time to have people settle down. Mm -hmm. And then they, they operate their agenda in search of the wisdom in the room, not in search of grinding through stuff at, at all costs. And so very often they'll get to the end of a meeting and I'll say, okay, those four things we didn't get to, let's pick another time to do those. But the, the ones they did get done were done really well. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is it looks like going slower, but they actually get more done because whatever happened in that meeting was robust and reliable and had traction. Yeah. As opposed to what happens in many meetings, you know, they get a 50% effectiveness on the time spent at best. And then people leave the meeting and everybody scatters having understood something different from the same meeting. Yeah. So, yes, there are time pressures, but so what? <laughs> yeah. You know, so I don't know if I gave too complicated an answer, but when you see how the mind works and how life works, time pressure is just a another thing to be managed or not if you realize you made it all up anyway <laughs> that it needs to be done on this date by this time by this amount by yeah, yeah. it's not i mean it's not i mean we, we work a lot with companies and have them form goals and visions and then as they work towards them they keep looking at do they make sense yeah and sometimes they realize oh no we should go this way 
and they change direction. Or time scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or what, and this is very, very interesting, which is since they, they get out of push mode, if they've reflected on a question a few times and an answer hasn't showed up, they start to wonder whether they got the right question. Right. And then they start to reflect on the question, and it happens every single time, Nick. When they're stuck, they back off, they wonder about the question. Out of nowhere, a new question shows up. They plop the new question on the table, bang. But particularly in the West, and by that I mean Europe and, and you know the US, as opposed to Asia, we don't spend a lot of time on the question. Yeah. We then get the question and jump into action. In Asia, they spend a lot more time. Do we have the right question? Now, what we notice is when people are connected to that intelligence, they spend more time on the question. Now, it's not a technique. It's just you start to, to, to head off in a direction, and somewhere in me I get this feeling, hang on, what, Nick, why are, we asking, why are we looking at this question? Mm. Do we have the right question? And then other people in the room who are also connected to their intelligence will go, yeah, I don't think we've got the right question, Nick. And then we'll have a little conversation, and we'll either fall behind what you're saying because it now makes sense, or we'll pick something different. Yeah. So this isn't technique. This is more like we're awake and paying attention and having this intelligence flow through us, which I'm sure everybody on the call has had multiple times in their life. Yeah. We're just making the very, very simple point that that intelligence is who we are. Yeah. We're the back office. We're not the amusement park on the front end that thinks it's running the show. That's just a little anachronism, a little thing to make life more interesting. Yeah. Who we are is this brilliance flowing through us that we don't control, but we can access. I love that. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to, I'm, I could just sit here for three hours and talk to you. I've got a couple of people with hands up though, so I want to come to um, questions. I want to help, uh, I'm going to come to Steph first. So let me unmute Steph. Hi Steph, can you speak? Yeah, I'm Nick. Hello, how are you? What question have you got for us? I'm great. Hi Robin. Hey Steph, how are you? I'm good mate, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, yeah, the question I, I, I had was, and it, it might be a little bit dumb, but I'm interested in the, the role that you play in the, um, at the point where you facilitate uh, the, the BHAG portion of, of your of your program with the client, yeah. and I'm interested to know what role you play. Um, in in them actually deciding on the goal, reaching on the reaching the goal and exceeding the goal, is is it purely uh, being able to to spot where they where they're getting busy minded and where they're getting off track and and, and pointing that out to them, or, or is there a lot more to it than that? Um, it's a great it's a great question. I mean, I was a management consultant, so my training was to jump in and drag people towards the answer that I thought they needed to have and hopefully have them agree that with the answer that I thought they should have. I, what, I'm, what I do now, uh, Steph, is I'm more like a driving instructor. So for the first two days where we're training people in the principles, we're essentially, it's, a, it's the equivalent to training people how a car works. In the, in the local parking lot, at the far end of the parking lot when there are no other cars with a bunch of cones. And then the point you were talking about is when they take the car out into the road. And I'm sitting there, and I'm watching how they drive, which is a bit, you know, they're busy-minded. Except I'm not pointing out, um, you know, when they're not doing things right. I'm noticing how, how much they remember what they've learned. And every now and then, the car will sort of go off and go into the ditch because, you know, they when they were changing gear, they looked down at the gear the gear knob, and so they took their eyes off the road, or worse, they dragged, turned the steering wheel as they were. And so I'll, what I'll do is we'll pull the car out of the ditch, and I'll sit down, and I'll say, okay, what happened? They go, yeah, the road tilted. I said, no, 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 the road didn't tilt. <laughs> what happened? Well, you know, I was going down to change the gear, and I said, what happened when you were changing gear? What happened to your eyes? And they go, oh, yeah, I forgot they're looking at the road thing. Okay, got it. 
off they drive again. And so we just basically keep reconnecting them to what they've learned. I mean, I'll, I'll give, you, give you an example. We, we, we set a team off on a business topic that they had chosen. And they're all being very, very polite with each other because they've learned, you know, calm. Or they think you have to be calm and settle. But the conversation's going nowhere. I mean, it's like a, it's like a lead balloon. But they're all trying to be, I wonder, reflective. And so at some point, we stop the conversation. It's probably 45 minutes in. Because at that point, you know, the, the car is half in the ditch and, the, and the, the wheel with the traction is spinning in the air. And we say, okay, what's going on? Are, are you making any progress? And they sort of sheepishly say, no, not really. And then we say, well, given what you've learned about how the mind works and the desire for success, what do you think is going on? Not, is it the right problem? Why aren't you coming up with more ideas? Going back to the principles, what do you think is going on? And you see them sit back and remember what they learned in, in, the, in, the, in the, the, the parking lot, you know, of the supermarket. And someone will say, well, if we all live in separate realities because we're all creating our thinking from the inside out, are we all having the same conversation? And then you have a bunch of people go, oh, that's a really good point. And then someone else says, well, let's check in to make sure we're all having the same conversation. And as they go around, it's 10 people, and they say, this is what I think we're talking about it becomes blatantly obvious that they're having 10 different conversations. So, you know, there's a lot of laughing, you know, no wonder we're not getting anywhere. And while they're doing that, the leader's been listening deeply to what each of them have been saying, because each of them is a different take on the same thing. And he says, you know what, I think we're actually talking about the wrong question. He plops a better question on the table. Everybody goes, that's it. 20 minutes, resolved. Now, we didn't make them resolve it. We just kept them pointing them back to what they had learned, they remembered what they weren't, what they knew now, which they had forgotten. And that got the car back on the road. And we do that for two days, till by the end of the two days, they're, they're catching themselves when they're going through the ditch. They're pulling themselves out. In fact, they're mostly avoiding the ditch because when you have 10 people in the car, you know, someone can tap the driver and say, excuse me, I think you're veering off a bit. Or, I think we need a break, because I noticed no one's really listening anymore. Or, have you noticed how people are just speaking over each other? So, I, I think we must, you know, the snow globe must, must be all shook, shook, uh, you know, shaken up, or whatever analogy they would come up with. And by the way, we let them come up with their own analogy. So, they'll stop, they'll take a break, they'll get back metaphorically on the road, and they'll do fine. And then they'll say, oh, this is interesting, we just have to pay attention to what's going on. And we go, exactly. And with 10 or 15 people in the room, the likelihood that they're all out to lunch at the same time is low. So there's always someone who can pull the, the red emergency handle and stop and then remind people, guys, I think we've forgotten, we've gone outside in. A lot of people use that. We've gone outside in. We're not paying attention to our thinking. Or I think we need a break. We've been going for them for too long. And by that point, they're, they're good. So our job is to have them drive reliably, given what they, the training they did with us in the first two days. So we don't monitor, we don't police, we remind. And then if we see that there's a point which they didn't really get from the first two days, you know, maybe they skated over it, well, then we might teach a tiny piece so that they can realize that piece a bit more deeply. So it's almost like you, you know how you get to, you can get these um, ice cream cones where with soft serve and they can blend they can blend the two flavors of ice cream. Well, the first two days it's just vanilla, and then the second day they introduce their business problem, but we keep the vanilla going on, so that all the way through their work they have they keep coming back as a touchstone to what they know about how the mind works. So whenever they're not getting the result they want, hang on, hang on. Let's lift up the bonnet and have a look at what's going on at the level of the principles. And then, so, so all our job is to make sure that they're, you know, we keep um, enough vanilla in the ice cream through the last two days so that they really get not only the business result, but they get to see how what they've learned powers the whole system. Yeah. So long, long explanation to a short question, Steph. Did I, did I answer it for you? Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense, Robin. That makes absolute perfect sense. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, I, and, and it's very, very simple, Steph. I mean, I mean, I, I was with a group in about four, well, probably six weeks ago. They got to the last half an hour of the two days, 
And the guy who facilitates the leadership team puts on a list of 10 things. This is to your deadline question, Nick. And says, okay, how are we going to get these 10 things done in the next half an hour? And you could feel the room sort of go, mm, get tight. Because people were going, oh, shit, we're not going to get it done. And mm. one guy who was a sort of a nervous Nelly, he was, he was really a sweet guy but would worry about everything. He was, yeah, we should do this, we do that. He really got, you could see him sort of getting all agitated. And I jumped in and I said, hang on, guys. What just happened? And people said, well, I know the feeling just sort of plummeted in the room. It was really off. I said, yeah, but what happened? And they said, oh, we just all got nervous. And I said, well, how are you going to get 10 things done if you're nervous? And they said, we can't. And then they all pointed to the nervous Nelly and said, and yeah, and you piled in there. You, that wasn't helpful. And he was like, sorry, you know. <laughs> and, th and then it was, I said, okay, given what you've learned, what would be useful for you now? And Thomas says, well, we need an insight because we've got 10 things and we've only got half an hour, so we're not going to figure it out. So you can see them all settle down. And then someone said, and it's, you know, it always, I always laugh, someone said, why do we have to get all 10 done today? <laughs> and everybody looks around, well, of course, why do we have to get them done today? So they had a lovely conversation for five minutes about which of the 10 things were really necessary. They identified three. They then had a nice 15-minute conversation on, and when they nailed the three of them, and they finished eight minutes early or seven minutes early. So all we did is we just keep putting up the, remember what's going on, guys. Remember what's going on. We're just, we're just reminding people. That's basically what we do for those two days. That's cool. Thank you, Steph. I'm going to, um, thanks, Steph. I know, I know we're almost on time, but... Are you happy to stay another 10 minutes or so, Robin? Because I've got another question oh, here yeah. from Madeline. I've got, I've got plenty of time. Um, cool. I know if, if some of you have to go, then we, we are recording this. But, um, but I've got Madeline here with her hand up, so I just want to see if, what question she's got. And then Amanda, I think, was going to ask something as well. Hi, Madeline. Well, hiya. I didn't actually mean to put my hand up, but now that I'm here, <laughs> I'm going to talk to you. It always works that to... way. <laughs> yeah. Technology has just introduced me into this meeting, that's just lovely. Um, it's been really interesting to listen to you, and I'm on this journey at the moment where I keep reading lots, watching videos, reading your blog, doing my things. I'm kind of intellectualising this to the nth degree, but not getting it. And I'm kind of going, there must be some step, some place, some shower that I'm not taking, some lawn that I'm not mowing, some whatever. The, and I'm just kind of going, so, so, what am I not doing? Maybe I shouldn't be doing. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Well, we, we grew up in a, in a society which, I mean, particularly in the education system, which teaches us to think a lot about things. And you've learnt a lot and done, accomplished a lot by thinking a lot about things. And there's nothing wrong with thinking a lot about things. I mean, I would not do my tax return without thinking about it. I would not sit there and say, well, didn't like the speeches in Parliament this year, so I'm, not, I'm only going to give uh, five quid. And that's all they deserve. No, you you got to think about it. Well, to learn this material, to learn about this understanding, thinking is not helpful. It's something you've got to see for yourself. And the way you see it, Madeline, is to not think so hard. And it means you've got to sort of look at it and see what makes sense for you about it. In the same way that, um, I don't know if you're a parent or whether you've, you've ever been somewhere in nature, where you just looked at nature and it, you, you could sort of feel it. Um, and it was true for you. So this isn't about concepts. This is about what you see that's really true for you in the moment. And so sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard to do that. I mean, I know I've got a lot on my mind. I, I, my ability to see the principles is limited. But I've noticed that the more I know which direction to look in, and the less I focus on the facts and the theories and the concepts. I mean, we have to start with concepts. But you don't want to learn anything here. You want to learn it about 18 inches lower. You want to let it soak in. And what we did with Nick for three and a half days is every time she would think too much, we'd slap her around and say, cut it Thank out. <laughs> <laughs> and she would sort of fall asleep, get grumpy, wonder why she was there. But the intelligence her, in her prevailed, gave her a massive nap, because that's what she needed, because she'd been thinking so hard, and then popped up a good answer. So you just need to know which direction to look. 
And if it feels like hard work, Madeline, you, you don't, you're overdoing it. This is a living, breathing, real thing that is going on now in the moment in you. You just need to know where to look. And the more you think about it, the less you'll see it. The thing, Madeline, as well, to... So if you've ever come across oh. feedback, just listen to some Sid. Um, Sid is not intellectual. No, I like, and I, I have to, this is terribly bad, but I do like listening to people with British accents talking about this because I find the Americans all a bit too schmaltzy. <laughs> and so it's great when I hear British accents. You know, Madeline, as well, well one of the things... One of the things that I think is um, really helpful as well, because I, yeah, I, I, I know where you're at. Like I, I remember when I first came across this understanding. But one of the things I think is really true is that y you use the words, so oh, I'm not getting it, but you are getting it. Because if you weren't getting it, you wouldn't keep coming back for more. So something's touching you, like something's resonating with you. That's you getting it. Like that thing of like, wanting to go back and watch the next video or be on the next call or, or do some reading or try and understand it is because at a deeper level, I don't know if you agree with this, Robin, but it's like you are getting it because if you were hearing nothing, you'd have been gone long ago. Like if you weren't getting it, there's nothing here for you, you'd be gone. But the fact that you keep, you know, there's, there's something, that's what I had when I first under, well, first heard about this was there's something here and I don't understand it. And it really frustrated me that I didn't understand it because I was a bright, fast, clever woman and I couldn't understand it. But I knew that there was something in it. And that's you getting it. That's you being impacted and touched by it, even though you can't really define what the it is. Like, that's because it's not at an intellectual level. So hopefully that, that reassures you as well. My, my, my learning really accelerated, Madeline, the, the less hard I tried. Mm. Because what Sid is pointing to is, is going on all the time. So I'm getting a thought. Air is coming over my vocal cords, which are vibrating. Sound waves are coming out of my mouth. They're hitting your eardrum. Three little bones are being moved. And my voice is appearing in your head. Now, I'm not doing that, and you're not doing that. It's phenomenal, the intelligence built into us. That intelligence knows how to learn this better than the, the, the amusement park at the front end, which we have been conditioned to use primarily to learn things. So you're actually designed to learn this, Madeline. As Nick says, you're just on your own journey, and it's not linear. And the less hard you try, the more you wonder and the more you, you look inside yourself as to what would make sense for you, the more the journey will accelerate. And then what's happened for me is I find that the journey is not an ending. There's no end to it. I just keep seeing things more and more and more. So how much I know and how much I don't know is actually no longer a question I ask myself. I just, I'm just grateful when I remember which direction to look in. Yeah. Thank you. So KIS, you know what KIS means? Simple? Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Just checking. I thought it was KIS, double loss, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> well, I'm I'm too polite for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Madeline. I've got Amanda with a question as well, so I'm gonna I'm gonna open up to her. Hey, Amanda. Hi, Nick. Hello. What question have oh, you got for us? Have you enjoyed I it? Uh, no, it's fantastic. Thank you. And um, yeah, Robin and um, Nick, Nick, has, Nick has really helped me actually already. Sort of a grasp quite a bit of it um sometimes keeping me back on track with busy thoughts which is fantastic um the question i've got actually is in relation to something you said earlier in the call which was that you often work with people and kind of help them get set up with goals and then they they sort of go on a path and discover you know that might not quite be the step etc and, and coincidentally, I've, I've got a session with a, a group of women next week, and it's around goal setting. And I was wondering, I was, my thought today was, I'd like, I, I know that many of their questions are, I don't quite know what it is yet, I don't know what it is, I'm supposed to have a career, you know, I don't know what change of career is, and they're, they're going a bit headspin with it. Um, 
and it's a bit for me I, i'm kind of thinking which comes first I, I kind of believe i set off in one direction with a goal that then took me to where i was and then where i am and so on so i want to encourage them to set some goals but then i'm a bit kind of like should it be more doesn't doesn't matter if you don't know just carry on somewhere or do you see what i mean i'm trying to kind of think how can i explain it that it's great to get something down and then that's the track but you might end up going down a different track with this with this kind of thinking involved well it's really good to have you know an idea it's really good to have a goal it's really good to know where you're going um but you want to hold all of that lightly and so I've often been with people who, when you, you've had them connect with their wisdom and say, well, you know, what makes sense? They'd say, I don't, I don't have a goal at the moment. I don't really know what I want. Now, if that's coming from a wise place, that's probably where they need to be. I mean, you know, sometimes people aren't, aren't, need, to have, need some internal reorganizing to happen before they get clear what they want. Now, what I know is that if you, if you look in the direction of your own wisdom, you will see what goals make sense and you'll see whether the goal you have is the one you should go with and you'll see whether you need the goal right now or whether flapping around is what you need to do. So I've become a lot less um, prescriptive since I've come across the principles. Now directionally, if you're trying to create an enterprise, it's really good to have an, an idea where you want to get to. But it's only a thought and who knows, you might come up with a better one later. And if one, if it doesn't feel right with the goal you have, well, then look for another one. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm more sort of uh, pragmatic and relaxed about it. Directionally, goals are good, but it doesn't mean you have to have them at, at all cost. And if it doesn't make sense to you not to have a goal, don't. I mean, I this intelligence is like the acid test for me. This intelligence flowing through is, it, I keep asking it all the time. In fact, my, one of my colleagues, Ken Manning. He doesn't think about anything for longer than 30 seconds. If he doesn't come up with an answer, he stops thinking about it. So it's a bit like people who do muscle testing to see whether, you know, something is right for them. I mean, the intelligence in you knows. So, I mean, what I would do is I would get into the world of the, of, of the people that you're with um, at that session and see what makes sense for them and see what your wisdom tells you. And... Your job, if there is a job, is to help them access theirs. Because once they've accessed their wisdom, they're good to go. They'll figure out what they need, goal or no goal. I mean, all, all our job really is, I think, in, in when it comes to helping other people, is to help them connect to their own intelligence and their own common sense. And then they'll see what makes sense for them. So a short version would be, it depends. <laughs> Well, okay. you know, a little light bulb moment. They're, they're on a transform a year of transformation, and one of the, I guess if, you know, there's somebody might say, I'm, you know, I want to sail around the world. What might be transformational for some of them as we go through the year is to have a deeper understanding of, of where they want to be, even though they don't know right now. Kind of thing. What What I think happens. Um is that when people spend more time connected to their intelligence or their wisdom, the transformation becomes an ongoing endeavor, not a once-off or 12-month thing. So another way to look at it is what you're doing is you're, you're doing the parking lot training for them to have transformation as an ongoing capability in them. Yeah. Because if you look, you know, I'm not the same person I was when I was in finishing you know, elementary school. I'm not the same person I was when I went to university. I'm not the same person when I first started work. I'm not the same person when I got my first people to manage. I'm not the same person when I had my first child. I mean, how have I progressed all the way through? Because the intelligence in me keeps reshaping how I think to cope with whatever and deal with whatever's going on. And it's been going on like that all your life. So you've got the goods. You've got the V12 engine in there. So have all of the people in your program. You just have to have them pay more attention to it. Yeah. It's funny. There's so many. Um, there's. It's. It's a great question, Amanda. And there's one of the things that I really learned from working with you guys was um, 
you know, I, I'd kind of, I, I don't know why, but I'd, this is the looking for prescriptions, right? I had, before I'd come along to your event, I was, I was, my understanding of the principle shows me that life's going to unfold and it's going to go in any which direction. And given that how it ends up has no bearing on my well-being, then I'm good for, like, why would anyone ever need to set goals? Therefore, one should not set goals, right? And then I came to Ken and Robin's event and the first question they put on the flip chart, which is what put me in a right bad mood, was, where do you want to be 12 months from now? <laughs> and then And then I was like, Oh, they're saying you should set goals. You should set goals. And one of the one of the really cool things that I came away from, I haven't had a chance to tell you yet, Robin, but came away from that event with the like, the principle says nothing about whether you should or shouldn't set goals. Like it doesn't say there are no rules, right? It's like, if it makes sense at whatever level of consciousness I'm at, whatever level of understanding I'm at, sometimes it will make sense to to set goals and sometimes it doesn't. And like it, who cares right it's like from that from that kind of w when I'm in that more settled down place sometimes I want to set goals and sometimes I really don't care and sometimes I change goals and sometimes I set new ones or whatever um but but that totally let me off the hook and it, and it had a wider implication of me realizing about oh there are no rules about this and that and this and that and where I'd been thinking that there were you know, the understanding of the principles means that X, Y, or Z. I realise that X, Y, Z is nonsense. It's just like the principles just describes what's going on. And that's it. It's really simple. It's simpler than I thought. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I, cool. I can give you an example. I was with a client who wanted to accomplish something. And so I, you know, because he wanted to accomplish, I asked him what it was. And he, he, he laid out the vision and the goal. And as I listened to him, it just didn't feel like it was true. Mm. It didn't feel like it was what he really wanted. And so it occurred to me to say, is that what you really want? I know this is rocket science. And he stopped <laughs> and you could see him, you know, considering my question. And then he said, no, I don't, I don't think it is what I want. And so guess what my next question was? What would you want? And he was like, I don't really know. And then I said, well, why do you think that is? He says, you know, I've, you know what thought just came from me, Robin? I've been on this 25-year dash of going here, going here, set the next goal, set the next goal, and I've been doing all of that, and, I, and I'm, I don't know if I want to do that anymore. And I said, is that a new thought? He said, yeah, I just had it now. I said, well, what do you want to do about it? He says, well, I'm sure I don't want to set a goal. And I said, well, what else do you see? He says, well, I've got all these concerns and things swirling that I should, I shouldn't. He said, that just feels like a lot of noise. I said, well, what's under the noise? And he says, I'm just seeing that I need to sit with this for a while to see what makes sense to me. I said, oh, great. Well, and I, and I could feel that, was, that felt true. Mm. So I said, well, that's what you should do. So we ended the meeting after half an hour without a goal. Yeah. Yeah, so it's perfect what you said, Nick. There's no rules. Yeah. There is... Well, if there is one rule, pay attention to what the intelligence in you is saying. Yeah. <laughs> That's but, the only rule. Yeah, and then and then sometimes it's so hard to do that it could be just because the 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 front office is so busy shuffling papers. You can't hear anything. <laughs> it's like, will you shut <laughs> up in there? <laughs> but it's that's the thing about knowing where to look, right? It's like I I love that analogy of the front office and the back office because it just like there's a feeling to the front office and I know when I'm in there up to my elbows in filing cabinets like I, I know it I feel it and it's just like oh not that not that and that kind of just opens up the door for the back office to do its thing and and just hand me stuff like it did after that four days of just total empty head we do a lovely exercise in the, in the we, we did a group program for 45 people before we did the one with you Nick and we do a lovely exercise where we have a person share for one minute a big problem or a question that they would love an answer on mm. to two people. And then after the one minute, the two people have a conversation about it as if the, the person who gave the answer, the gave the question wasn't there. They're not allowed to ask any clarifying questions. They're, they're not allowed to talk to the person. And they talk for seven minutes about what they, they think might be going on. And they're not responsible for solving the problem. It's mm. not their issue. They just shoot the breeze, if you want, about what they heard. 
after a minute. What invariably happens is the person who shared the problem gets a ton of insights from two people who only had had one minute of scoping of the problem. And this was invariably a problem that the person who, who spoke it had had for a lot of time and had spent hours thinking about. And here are two people who know nothing who came up with better ideas than they could. There's wisdom in everybody. That's the point. Yeah. And if you access the wisdom, it will show you what to do. Yeah. And if you can't access it, well, then just wait. It's a bit like a bus, you know. If it hasn't showed up, just wait. <laughs> yeah. And know where a bus stop is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and know that there are such things as bus stops. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And what they're designed to do, and there's an infinite supply of buses. Yeah, I love that. That's a love. That's a lovely note for us to end on. Thank you, Robin, so much for coming along and doing this with us today. And mm, thank you, well everyone, lovely. who's come along and stayed stayed that little extra bit of time to spend some time with us. We'll make sure we put the recording up as well for anyone who missed it. Because uh, I know there's a lot of people who wanted to be here that couldn't. So um, there's people eagerly waiting for us to put the replay up. And um, I know I'm going to speak to you again next week anyway, Robin. But um, thank you to everyone for coming along. And um, have a good rest of your day or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.